This is the corn. If you've never seen a keyboard like this, two things probably stand out. One, it's really two halves of a keyboard. And two is that it's very small, even smaller than my hand. This video is about the theory behind this keyboard, and I'm gonna to try to keep it as beginner level as I can. Let's start by breaking down those standout qualities. Because it's split, you can put these halves close together or far apart on your desk. If you notice, I'll exaggerate here, my shoulder position, as I put these closer, my shoulders hunch forward. As I put them back, I get to more of a neutral position. That neutral position is really important if you're feeling strain or want to prevent that in the future. The other standout quality is how small this is. It's only got 36 keys. If you consider a traditional keyboard, your right hand naturally rests here on the home row with your pinky on the semicolon. In order to press backspace, you need to move this far away to press that key. That may cause strain. Maybe you end up rotating such that you hit it with your ring finger, but even if it doesn't cause strain and just kind of resetting back to a normal position, maybe you end up being one column off and now you're making typos as you type. On the corn, you don't ever have to reset from normal typing because at any given time, you are at most one key away from where your finger needs to be. Even with the thumb keys, these three that you have at the bottom, just small lateral movements get you to all three. And so as a result, you have very little hand movement on a keyboard like this. And if I mess up, I can still use the backspace or arrow keys to fix it. So let's say I messed up this, I could just go back and press backspace on it. Okay, sure, there's less hand movement. But if we look at a traditional keyboard, we see that there are dedicated keys for numbers, dedicated keys for function keys, for arrow keys, and for modifier keys. Where are all those keys on the corn? And it's true, if you were to just put the English alphabet on the corn, you'd be left with 10 keys, which you could use for numbers, and then you'd have run out completely. So if only there were some industry that had solved this problem nearly 50 years ago, and oh wait, what's that on my desk? It's a video game controller. And if we think about video games, they typically have way fewer buttons than they do actions in the game. So how did they accomplish this? Well, there are four techniques that they use. One of them is if you press a key once, it'll do something, so maybe I'm moving right now, and if I double tap it, it will make me dash in that direction. So we could have the same key be pressed repeatedly for a different action. We could have it that you hold a key for a different action. Maybe you jump with this and you jump even higher by holding it down. You could have it so that when you hold one key and press another, it does something. It's the most famous example in video games being Mario games. You hold the run key and a direction and Mario moves faster. Or you could have it so that you press many buttons at once to do something. So a lot of old games had LR, select and start to reset the game. We can apply all those same things to a keyboard. For example, this key is the comma and this key is the period. And together, it types out a comma and a period, a semicolon. Similarly, this key is E, but if I hold this other key with my left hand, it turns into a five. So I can use this to form a custom layout that makes sense to me, and I don't have to use any features I don't want. For example, I don't like the idea of having to repeatedly press a key to get it to do something different, so I just don't use that feature. So now we know the building blocks of how you'd get more than 36 functions out of a keyboard that only has 36 keys. But how do people actually use this in practice? Well, the most common feature that people with keyboards like this use is called layers. And if you've used a smartphone in the last decade, then you're already familiar with this. So I've got my phone open here, I'm sharing the screen. And if I open the keyboard, we can see I can pretty easily type letters, exactly what you'd expect. If I wanna type numbers or symbols though, the easiest way to do that is to press this greenish key at the bottom left. And now all the letter keys changed into numbers and symbols. And the natural evolution for a phone is of course to add an emoji layer because of how common emojis are now and how many of them there are. So layers are a way of keeping related keys together and you essentially sacrifice one button in order to change the other 30 to be a different function. Back on a computer keyboard, we see the same general ideas that we see on the phone. And so these are my layers. I have a default layer of letters as do most people who have keyboards like this. So if you just go up to one of these keyboards and start poking at random keys, you'd probably type out a letter or you might hit some of the more common punctuations for sentences. We have numbers here, so I can type out numbers. We have symbols. Navigation is for things like home, end, page up, page down, up, down, backspace, delete. Function keys, if you don't have dedicated function keys on your keyboard. And then finally, special keys for something like controlling the volume or even for controlling the mouse through the keyboard and being able to click things. You've seen how I can type practically anything, but we haven't talked about modifier keys yet. How do I type something like control or shift? Well, shift in particular is such a common key press that I have a dedicated key for it. So if I hold this key down, I can type out capitalized letters. But that's it, that was my 36th key and we now exhausted all of the keys on this keyboard. So how do I type the other modifiers? Well, remember the video game controller example? We need to use one of those techniques to cram more functions into our keyboard. 
And we just talked about layers. Layers are actually one of the ways I accomplish this. So if I were to enter the number layer for right now, the right half of the keyboard will type out numbers. But the left side of the keyboard, I have Control, Alt, Command, and Shift in that order. And they're all where my hands naturally rest. So the easiest way to show this off is to hold the Shift key here. And then I type those same numbers. And now they're the symbols that correspond to those numbers. Of all the things I talk about in this video, this next segment is the most advanced. I just talked about how I have modifier keys in my layers. So how do I do something like send command N because N is not inside one of those extra layers. So if I were to enter the number layer now, this key becomes four. So if I hold command and press this key, I'm actually pressing command four. So the way that I send command N is I need to enter the number layer, press command, let go of the number layer key, and then I can press N to activate command N. And you see it opening new tabs up here at the top. That's not necessarily a problem. You can get used to this gesture. So I can press the number layer, press command, and let go of the number layer and get used to doing that pretty quickly. It's kind of this rolling motion. But to make it easier on myself, I gave myself a combo. So just like earlier, we had comma and period can form semicolon when pressed together. Well, I have NEI. When I press all three of these keys together, I get command on the keyboard. And from here, I could do something like press C and then V to copy and paste. But hold on, copy pasting isn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to use this to be able to press command N. And for this, I use one shot modifiers. To show this off, I'm gonna turn on the lights on my keyboard when a modifier is active. So now if I went into the number layer and press the command key, you'll see it light up yellow. And then if I let go of the keyboard completely, it's still lit up. And what this is, is it's an indication that the next key that I press is going to have command applied to it. So when I press N, it's going to send command N and it darkens the key. That is the one shot part of one shot modifiers. It was only allowed for one key. And so if I were to press that same combo from earlier, we see that it also lit up this key. And now I can just let go of all the keys completely and at my leisure, press N if I want to. This works for all of the modifier keys. So I have Control, Alt, Command, and Shift, and we can see them all light up. It's not like I had to press them all at the same time to do that, and I can press any combination of them that I want for this to work. The reason why one-shot modifiers are helpful is because now, instead of having to do that rolling motion of the number layer and then Command and then let go of the number layer, I can now let go of both things at once. So I press number layer and then Command and let go of both. And that way, I don't need to be as cognizant of what keys are held and I just need to look down at my keyboard and see the lights and know that I'm about to press Command N. Like I said, that was the most advanced thing we're going to be covering in this video. And the only reason it's even a consideration is because of how few keys my keyboard has. If you like the idea of split keyboards but find it ridiculous to have to manage your own modifier keys like that, then good news, split keyboards come in practically any size. I have the five column corn, which is what gives it 36 keys, but what's pictured here is the six column corn, so it has an extra three keys on each side for a total of 42. This is the largest keyboard you can have while still maintaining that property of being only one unit away from any key you need to reach. And by doing this, you could have devoted modifier keys here like Control, Alt, and Command, and then put your Shift key over here or something and never need to pop into layers to use those. If you want to go even bigger than that, you can consider something like the Lily 58, which not only has those extra keys on the side, but also gives you an entirely extra row with dedicated number keys. I do want to be transparent and share some of the downsides of a keyboard like this. The biggest one by far is the learning curve. It'll take you a couple of weeks just to get used to typing on something like this, but then you'll be fighting your muscle memory for months. I've had this keyboard for more than two years now, and while I love it, I would say that I've invested a significant amount of time learning it. A minor downside is gaming on a keyboard like this. With only 36 keys, you're sacrificing a lot of dedicated keys, and you want dedicated keys for gaming, so they're not thinking about what you're pressing and you're not taking extra time doing it. Finally, price, even though you're only paying for this keyboard once, it is pretty hefty. This vendor that I was showing here, it's nearly $300. You could build a keyboard like this yourself, which is what I did. I spent maybe about $150 and ended up with a significant amount of extra parts if I wanted to build another one, but that took a lot of time sourcing those parts and then soldering them all together. If you wanna get into a keyboard like this and you don't wanna spend that amount of money before you know that you're gonna like it, I think what you can do is you can get a cheaper keyboard that supports custom firmware and then just add one layer to it, a navigation layer and put arrow keys and backspace and enter and see if you like that and if it transforms your keyboard experience. For me, that's all it took and that's what got me down this rabbit hole all the way to the corn and it's been fantastic ever since and that's why I'm making videos like this now. 
I'm going to share a few links in the description. One is my key map, so you can see what layout I use and maybe take some inspiration from it. I'm going to share the bill of materials that I use to build my corn. And I'm going to share a video from a little over two years ago that talks about me going from the Microsoft Natural Ergonomic Keyboard to the corn. I hope you liked learning about this wacky keyboard and that you found it at least mildly intriguing. As always, thank you very much for watching.